In 1925, people lined up for lessons as a new dance craze, the Charleston, swept America. A new president was inaugurated at DePauw, Lemuel Merlin, an 1891 graduate of the university who had led Boston University for 13 years. A good workout in Bowman Gym, a restful sleep, or even a giddy moment couldn't make students forget that it had been four years since they'd defeated their arch rivals in football. At 2-4-1 heading into the big game, the Tiger prospects seemed bleak. Wabash came in at 4-3-1, with one of their wins coming against Purdue. On game day, DePaul sent a 60-member band and more than half of its student body to Crawfordsville. A furniture store offered a free turkey to the first Wabash player to score a touchdown. Dana Gibson, Wabash halfback, was the lucky recipient. He rambled more than 50 yards for Paydirt after grabbing an interception and was given the live bird after the game. Things got so comfortable for the Little Giants that Coach Pete Vaughn took a seat on the sidelines. On this day, for the first time ever, Vaughn employed a huddle to call plays, and virtually everything worked. On a dry, sunny afternoon, Wabash scored 16 points in the first half while shutting out their visitors from the south yet again. When it was over, Tiger's smiles were forced after a fifth straight scoreless setback. Heading into the final game of the 1926 season, Wabash's 4-4 four four record was deceiving. The Little Giants had posted shutouts over Evansville, Ball State, and Butler. Three of their losses came to Purdue, Minnesota, and Illinois. The team's fighting spirit was personified by Gordon Helm, who played without a helmet long after headwear became standard gear. DePauw had battled to a 4-2-1 record. As student journalists geared up for a key annual assignment, fans gathered on campus lawns and street corners to discuss what-ifs, and Tiger supporters got fired up at a pregame pep rally. On a cold, rainy day, the winning drive was a long one. Wabash running backs Fred Stu Myers and Clarence Peace carried the ball for 43 yards and four first downs, culminating in a Myers touchdown plunge from one yard out with about three minutes to play. A desperate attempt by DePauw to even the score, led by Dick Sturtridge, came up 25 yards short of the goal line. The final chapter in this football season was again written in scarlet letters. For DePauw fans, it meant bring on basketball season. On September 30, 1927, the streets of Greencastle were buzzing with news that Yankee slugger Babe Ruth had clobbered his 60th home run of the season. But that fall, DePaul's football team wasn't setting any records. Coach William L. Hughes brought his team to Crawfordsville for the season's final battle with a 4-3 record. Captained by Perry Lower, Wabash was 6-2, with one of those setbacks coming at the University of Iowa. This contest stayed scoreless until just before halftime when coach Pete Vaughn sent in an entirely new backfield and the Little Giants started to rumble. A 40-yard completion for a touchdown gave the home team a lead. In the third quarter, a 60-yard DePaul drive ended with a scoring run by Don Brandenburg, marking the first time the Tigers had dented the scoreboard against their rivals since 1920. But a second Wabash touchdown in the game's final minutes produced a familiar outcome, a seventh straight Little Giant triumph in this series. Three weeks before the annual clash with Wabash, the 1928 Tigers, led by their coach William L. Hughes and seen in practice here, made the longest journey in the football program's history, traveling to West Point to play Army, a game DePaul lost 38 to 12. The following week, Army played Notre Dame in the legendary contest in which coach Newt Rockney successfully implored his squad to win one for the Gipper. Heading into the rivalry game, DePaul was five and two with the other loss to Purdue. Wabash was four, three and one, and was coming off a 14-0 setback in which they'd held the Boilermakers scoreless over the final three periods. When students weren't posing with their cars, climbing roofs, or creating other kinds of mischief, 
they were pinning their hopes on a victory over the other guys. The Little Giants scored two touchdowns in the first quarter on runs by Clayton Weist and Russell Hankins, after which, as a newspaper writer declared, they quit for the day. DePaul put seven points on the board in the second quarter on a Don Brandenburg run and 13 more in the third stanza. One on a fumble recovery in the Wabash end zone, another when Brandenburg grabbed a second fumble and raced in from 25 yards out. For the first time since 1920, bragging rights returned to Greencastle. As the Roaring Twenties ended, Wabash became the first Indiana college to play football under the lights. Every 1929 home game except the DePauw contest was played at night. The smiles and fancy duds in the Tiger grandstands were befitting a winning team. DePauw's October 19th game at Purdue's ross Aid Stadium became the first of three straight losses the Tigers suffered after winning their first three. Six days after the Boilermaker game, economic suffering hit home with what history recalls as Black Friday, the stock market crash that paved the way for the Great Depression. 29 days later, with America still reeling, an annual football rivalry was renewed. Reginald Sullivan, mayor-elect of Indianapolis and 1898 Wabash graduate, got out of his office and was on hand to see a game that DePauw was slightly favored to win. Pete Vaughn's three and five Little Giants got on the scoreboard first when DePauw's Guernsey Van Riper grabbed a punt and for some reason retreated into his team's end zone, leading to a safety. The visitors grabbed a lead in the third quarter when halfback Hugh Hogan hauled in a flat pass and rambled in for a touchdown. But halfway through the final period, Wabash mounted a drive that decided the outcome. On fourth and goal from the 10, Clayton Weist took a handoff shook off three Tiger tacklers and went into the end zone standing up. The vintage scoreboard shows the final tally. A new decade brought a new academic building to the DePauw campus. Asbury Hall was dedicated on June 7, 1930 and not long after, a new coach, Wabash graduate and former Little Giant assistant Raymond Gaumey Neal, began his first set of football practices at the Greencastle School. The Tigers made headlines in early November with a trip to Boston University, and a big crowd was on hand at the train station to welcome the Tigers home after they trounced their hosts 22 to 7. DePaul entered the Wabash game with a 5 and 1 record. The Little Giants had won their first three contests and then dropped five in a row. But three of those setbacks were the result of missed extra points. On the morning of the big game, Vandals painted the DePauw ticket booth red and, in a move that no doubt aided investigators, added the phrase, Wabash fans admitted free. A record crowd of 4,000 gathered at Blackstock Field and the fans wearing red were cheering early. In the first quarter, Wabash's Ralph Weingartner blocked a DePaul punt. It led to a touchdown, but the extra point attempt was, you guessed it, no good. In the fourth quarter, with 12 minutes to go, DePaul's Don Wheaton connected with Forrest Crane on a touchdown pass, and that tied things up. On the all-important extra point attempt, Wheaton fumbled a bad snap from center, but scooped the ball up and squirmed around the left end to give DePaul a one-point win. In the 1931 renewal of this rivalry, Wabash, led by future school Hall of Famers Harry Red Varner and Gary Vinroot, came in with a 3-4-1 and one record and hopes of ending the season on a high note. The Tiger faithful made their way to Crawfordsville, some by bus, others in what amounted to billboards on wheels. And the crowd witnessed a defensive struggle. Over the course of the afternoon, the teams punted 11 times each. A first quarter interception by Buzz Smith set up a Wabash touchdown and the home team held a 7-0 lead at halftime. In the third quarter, DePauw quarterback Don Wheaton scampered 15 yards around the right end for a touchdown, but Wheaton's extra point kick was no good. Still trailing by a point in the fourth quarter, Wheaton tossed a 35-yard touchdown pass to Robert Bradley, seen in this photo, 
and this time the extra point kick was good. For leading the Tigers to a 7-1 record, Wheaton was named All-State quarterback. United Press deemed him better than the signal callers at Notre Dame, Purdue, and IU, and he was named an honorable mention AP All-American. Forty-two years after DePaul and Wabash first met on the football field, the rivalry marched forward with a new prize. In 1932, the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville Railroad Company, also known as the Monon, donated one of its locomotive bells, which would, from this year forward, go to the winner of the annual game. The day before the contest, an article in the DePaul, which you can see in the left margin of this picture, called the new trophy the Victory Bell. Wabash, seen here in its 1932 team photo and in action earlier that season, came into the big game with a 4-2 record. DePaul was 3-4 on the season. This photo in particular shows the Tigers against Earlham. As you can see from DePaul's 1932 schedule, as well as the program, game day was also Dad's Day. After a week of snow and cold weather which forced the teams to practice indoors, Blackstock Field was streaked with frozen mud and ice and the footing was treacherous. In fact, crews worked two days straight clearing 12 inches of snow. DePaul's cheerleaders and 2,500 Chile fans witnessed a game that ended in a scoreless tie. There was some debate over which school would keep the new prize. One report indicated that Wabash tried to claim it. Since DePaul had won in 1931, the bell initially went to Greencastle. But legend has it, it remained in an undisclosed location until the two teams met again the following fall. Students of football history know this was a team for the ages. The 1933 DePaul Tigers were the nation's last college football team to complete a season undefeated, untied, and unscored upon. In their seven games, the Tigers outscored their opponents 136 to nothing. The Indianapolis News wrote at the time that the players under their beloved coach, Gaumi Neal, were always hustling for their jobs because of energetic reserves. Here was a thoroughly amateur college football team having a lot of fun Saturday after Saturday. Number 11, Mr. Walter Goes, the class of 36. Number 15, Bob Bradley, class of 35 from Fort Wayne, Indiana. 50 years after they made history, the men of the 1933 team reunited on Old Gold Day and a network television news crew captured the proceedings as the team members were introduced at Blackstock Stadium. They also gathered at the university's new athletic center, which they raised nearly $3 million to help build in honor of their coach, a Wabash graduate, whose name graces the field house. The secret of the, uh, the team was we didn't have any professionals. We were all out there to have fun. And uh, we had, one, we had uh, the coach, a coach that all of us would uh, give our lives for. As Coach Neal's squad did every Saturday in 1933, a win was the result of the game in Crawfordsville, a shutout that determined the first outright winner of the Monon Bell after a tie the year before. These Tigers sealed their legend with a 14-0 triumph. In 1934, DePaul was enjoying a second consecutive undefeated season, winning six of their first seven games by shutouts, and had only given up six points all year, the first a Tiger squad had allowed since 1932. As the legendary Professor Henry B. Longdon prepared for his retirement, DePaul students cheered victory after victory and decorated their living units for Old Gold Day. On the Wabash campus, undergraduates had a 3-2-2 two, and two football team to cheer on and some pranks to pull before the big game. In the dead of the night, they painted red W's on DePaul's campus sidewalks 
as well as on the statue of the owl that guards historic East College. Bad weather was predicted for Monon Bell Saturday, but the game wound up being played under bright fall sunshine before 5,000 fans. The Little Giants took the lead in the second quarter when Herm Burns connected with William Bowie Snyder on a 58-yard touchdown pass. Paul Henry Mueller provided the extra point. In the fourth quarter, DePaul's Bob Fribley, seen in this photo from the game, scored from four yards out. But his attempt to run the ball in for the extra point was stopped short. It marked the first time in five tries that Wabash graduate and former assistant coach Gaumi Neal had been bested by his former teacher and boss, the veteran coach Pete Vaughn. In the 1930s, a rite of passage for Wabash men was the burning of the pots. Freshman fraternity pledges were required to wear their pots or beanies at all times during the year. They were then permitted to burn them to mark their promotion to sophomores. Heading into the football season's rite of passage, both the 1935 Little Giants and Tigers were red hot. Wabash was 6-1 and, and had outscored opponents 211-30. DePaul was 5-0-1, but had several key injuries as they entered the battle for the bell, which was displayed in the back of a truck on game day. Tiger fans made their way to Crawfordsville aboard two special trains, one from Greencastle, the other from Indianapolis, along with a dollar round trip bus. A crowd totaling 3,000 gathered on a cold day at a muddy Ingalls Field. Most of the game was played in the middle of the turf, although Wabash got as close as DePaul's 15-yard line. On the game's final play, DePaul's Hal Hickman intercepted a Wabash pass at the Tiger 20-yard line. And this one ended with the scoreboard showing the same numbers as when it started. As Wabash students looked forward to the 1936 version of their football rivalry with DePaul, they had plenty of reason for optimism. The Little Giants were 6-1 with their lone defeat and 8-7 loss to Butler. To the south, there wasn't a whole lot for the Tiger Band or any fans to beat the drum over. Three wins, two losses, and two ties were on the Tigers' ledger before the season-ending game. A Monon Bell advertisement promised a game of thrills for a dollar and ten cent bleacher seat that would have bought 11 gallons of gasoline back then. On this day, three men made sure the Bell would remain at Wabash. Sophomore quarterback William Pack threw two touchdown passes to senior Lenny Wolf, and John White returned a punt 88 yards for a score. Wabash students were rewarded for the win with an extra day tacked on to Thanksgiving break. Having been victorious in just one of the first five battles for the Monon Bell, the Tigers were prowling for momentum and piling up wins in the fall of 1937. They knocked off Ball State on Old Gold Day 13-0 and came into the Wabash game 6-1 with their only loss to Butler University. The Little Giants, led by senior halfback Dick Cooney, had played Butler to a scoreless tie in front of 8,000 people. Crippled by injuries and with only one 200-pound player on the roster, Wabash was 3-2-2 two, two before a game that even got the attention of a local movie house. The Bell Contest was also homecoming for the men from Crawfordsville. Wabash fumbled early and never regained their footing. Led by Captain Jack Oswald, DePaul scored one touchdown in each of the first three quarters and added two in the final stanza. The result was the rivalry's biggest margin of victory in 25 years.